Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for inviting me to the Asia Society's virtual seminar on the occasion of the 75th General Assembly. I'm delighted with this opportunity to share Korea's experience in dealing with COVID-19 and our outlook on the changing global landscape in the midst of the pandemic. Korea has been touted as somewhat of a success story when it comes to COVID-19, and I can only thank my colleagues in disease control, public health, and central and local administrations for this. They have indeed been doing a remarkable job. But today's success is not a guarantee for success in the long run, because COVID-19 is very tricky and very much an ongoing story. Globally, the pandemic has claimed over 31 million victims so far and is still spreading. At around a quarter of a million, the daily toll of new cases is not visibly slowing down yet, and thousands of lives are being lost to the virus every day. It is resurging in many countries with waves that are even higher and bigger than the first. Korea, too, is currently emerging from a second wave after weeks of concerted efforts to contain it. And we are bracing ourselves for the very real possibility of more waves as the cooler months approach. Furthermore, even if we are succeeding, others also have to be succeeding for an open and free country like Korea that greatly depends on vibrant engagement with others in a rules-based international order. Let me first sum up some of the key features that have made for Korea's successes against COVID-19 so far. First, we were well prepared. We had beefed up our infectious disease control regime based on some painful lessons learned from previous failures. After the debacle over the mayor's outbreak in 2015, the legal framework was strengthened to give more authority to the health and disease control uh, experts. Manuals were thoroughly reviewed and updated. Support was doubled for R&D in viruses and infectious diseases. So we were ready to scale up our testing, tracing, and treatment regime, the three Ts, which are the basic ingredients in fighting any infectious disease. Most of all, we were very quick to develop and scale up the production of the test kits. We had the first test kit developed, approved, and ready for use by February 4th, barely two weeks after the first patient was identified. Since then, scores of test kits have been approved, and many are now being exported to other countries. Second, we have taken a whole-of-government approach in fighting COVID-19. Since late February, the Prime Minister has been chairing the daily meeting of the COVID-19 Response and Management Committee with all relevant government ministries, including the Foreign Ministry and the 17 provincial governors and city mayors participating. The daily conversation at the highest level between the central and local administrations has, given in, has been instrumental in keeping track of the virus spread, identifying problems and finding solutions, pooling medical and administrative resources, and staying unified on messaging to the public. Third, we have stuck to the principles that define us as a democracy. Openness, transparency, civic activism, and innovativeness. Rather than closing down internally with lockdowns or externally with border closures, we have kept society open and borders open with restrictions phased in and out only as necessary and proportionate to the risk of the virus spread. Transparency has meant full disclosure with the public about what the government is doing or not doing, what we know or don't know based on evidence and science. Civic activism has always been a strength of our country and is as shined against, against COVID-19, especially in the volunteers that made up for the lack of manpower and innovative solutions that complemented government measures. For example, the drive-through and walk-through testing stations were doctor's ideas that were adopted and scaled up by the government. Private citizens developed smartphone applications that provided real-time information about the closest pharmacy where certified facial masks can be bought. The downside has been the spread of groundless rumors, 
false information and hostility toward minority groups on the social media, which we have been trying to track down and delete in collaboration with the service providers. The steadfast adherence to these principles has won the trust of the public in government action, generally speaking. Democracies are full of diverse and divisive voices, and we embrace this as an inherent part of life. Some critics and detractors have refused to cooperate with the government's COVID-19 measures. Indeed, they were the major source of the outbreak that led to the second wave. Some still refuse, and stubborn non-cooperation can only be dealt with strict law enforcement. But this goes to further underscore the importance of trust between the protector and the protected in crisis response. Without trust, success is not possible even with the most advanced disease control tools. Fourth, we have adhered to the same principles of openness, transparency, and trust in our COVID-19 related engagement with other countries. As one of the first countries to be hit by the pandemic, we were compelled to deal with the multifaceted socioeconomic challenges that COVID-19 has entailed. Social distancing, airport quarantine, keeping track of inbound travelers, online schooling, elections, and so forth. And we have readily shared our experience through countless webinars and video conferences. We've been able to meet many requests for humanitarian assistance, even as our budget has been extremely stretched by domestic economic stimulus packages. We are restructuring our development assistance with key partners to focus on the public health sector. We have actively participated in regional and global discussions to shore up political and financial solidarity to overcome the pandemic and its devastating fallout. We've also been working with willing partners to maintain essential travel of people in the midst of closed borders and, challenge and canceled air flights. These exchanges are essential to the well-being of our economies and societies. They're also the building blocks in restoring the global solidarity that has been sorely tested by the pandemic. On vaccines, we're actively participating in the COVAX facility led by the WHO and Gavi, which is designed to finance vaccine development and production through collective funding and purchasing. Our goal must be to support equitable and adequate access to treatments and vaccines for all countries. How much we succeed in this will set the tone for the future of multilateral work, not only in the global health sector, but for multilateralism overall. As we ponder the world beyond COVID-19, I would draw the broad contours of Korea's foreign policy along the following key points. First, we will be an active player in revitalizing multilateralism. Korea owes much of its national development as a liberal democracy and open market economy to the rules-based multilateral international order. And we, will, we are very concerned about the waning confidence in multilateralism. The trend began long before COVID-19, but the pandemic has exacerbated it. Indeed, COVID-19 has exposed the inherent vulnerability of existing multilateral institutions and the global governance system. The divisive member states dynamics at the WHO in the aftermath of the outbreak undermined efforts to forge the much needed global solidarity in tackling the crisis. But the pandemic has also made clear that cross-border threats like infectious diseases require close collaboration with others. A country cannot be safe if its neighbors, far or near, are not safe from the threats. Enlightened self-interest would have countries actively contributing to the safety of their neighbors. And motivated by such enlightened self-interest and with focus and realism, rather than mere aspiration, we can turn this crisis into an opportunity to breathe new energy into multilateralism. The role of middle powers is crucial in this process, more so as a big power rivalry inside and outside the multilateral settings is becoming more intense. Korea strives to facilitate the formation of like-minded coalitions and build solidarity among middle power countries that share universal values such as democracy, 
the market economy, and human rights. Thus, we have joined the Alliance for Multilateralism, which is an informal network of more than 50 countries that seek to shore up multilateral institutions. We have also joined up with like-minded member states in New York, Geneva, and Paris to support the pandemic-related work of UN entities. Second, the ROK-US alliance will remain the linchpin of peace and security on the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia, and the anchor of Korea's foreign and security policy. Over the past seven decades, the relationship has grown from a military alliance to a comprehensive alliance of shared values and interests and thriving ties between our two peoples. COVID-19 has brought us together. The Korean government has spared no effort to support the United States, airlifting hundreds and thousands of testing kits, providing millions of face masks to FEMA, as well as to American veterans of the Korean War. Having successfully held national, nationwide elections in April, we have shared that experience with U.S. election officials at the federal and state levels. Remarkably, we have kept our borders fully open to travelers from each side. This stands out as an exception amidst all the entry bans and restrictions that remain in place around the world, standing testimony to the exceptional nature of our relationship. Third, we will stay the course with the Korean Peninsula peace process based on the close coordination with the United States and our neighbors. Even, through the, even though the process has been stalled for a while, we cannot underestimate the milestone agreements reached between the leaders of South Korea, the United States, and North Korea in 2018 to achieve complete denuclearization and lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. In the meanwhile, we have offered inter-Korean cooperation in fighting COVID-19 and future pandemics. After all, from the viewpoint of the viruses or other cross-border threats, South and North Korea is a single ecosystem. The logic also applies to the larger region. Thus, President Moon has proposed to launch a Northeast Asia Cooperation Initiative for Infectious Disease Control and Public Health, that would bring North Korea together with China, Japan, Mongolia, and South Korea to work together against diseases and other disasters. North Korea's stonewalling of our call to dialogue and offer of assistance on COVID-19 has tested our patience. Earlier this week, its Navy shot dead and burned the body of a South Korean fisheries official who had drifted north in the West Sea. We are trying to ascertain how and why he drifted north. We have condemned this shocking and inhuman act by the North Korean military and urged Pyongyang to thoroughly investigate the crime and punish the perpetrators. The terrible incident underscores the difficulty of engaging with North Korea, a closed and insulated country whose behavior is often unacceptable and must be told so but with the abiding support of the international community for our efforts and based on the solid combined defense posture of the ROK-US alliance, we will stay the course in pursuit of our goal of complete denuclearization and lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. And let me close my re beginning remarks there, and I'm now happy to engage in the interaction. Thank you. Wonderful. Minister Kong, thanks so much. Uh, first of all, thanks for joining us uh, today during Virtual Ongo Week, but also thanks for your very clear and informative remarks. I, I love your insights. Without trust, you won't have success. So spoken like an experienced international diplomat. And speaking of which, you made a very effective case for multilateralism. I, I can't resist mentioning that I early in my career, played a, a tiny, tiny role in the uh, ROK, the South Korean accession to full UN membership in the early 90s when I served at the U.S. mission to the UN. And listening to you reminds me just how valuable that turned out to be for the entire world. So thanks. I'm going to start with a few questions of my own, but uh, the audience on Facebook and YouTube is starting to send in questions on social media, and I'll be sure to fold those in. 
Now, Minister, you began by talking about COVID-19, and so maybe I could start there as well, particularly as it relates to U.S.-South Korea relations. You know, the U.N. obviously is marking its 75th anniversary now in the middle of this brutal pandemic. Uh, I think we're just past a million deaths. Uh, but when you look at our two countries, it's such a dramatic study in contrast. As you described, um, you know, despite a second wave, uh, South Korea has moved very quickly, efficiently through digital contact tracing, manufactured tests, use mass transparency, close cooperation with the WHO. I think uh, you've had fewer than, or just around 23,000 cases, fewer than 400 deaths. And in contrast, the United States with more than 7 million cases just passed the 200,000 fatality mark. Uh, and by the way, has announced the withdrawal from the WHO. So it's probably no surprise that a recent poll found that where 86% of South Koreans say that their government, you, did a great job. 52% of Americans say that our government did a bad job. So could you talk a little bit about the effect of COVID on Korean public attitudes towards the U.S.? Because I know that in, in democracies like ours, public attitudes can can shape or limit our foreign policy options. Well, thank you. I think, you know, I, I think I already introduced a comment uh, that indicated the depth and the width of the, the, the bilateral ties. I think I pointed to the, uh, the maintenance of the, the flights between the two countries, 90 flights every week still carry. And I think some people are quite surprised that we have still planes flying between countries, but between the United States and Korea, it was extremely important uh, that we maintain that, um, that people to people exchange, family visits, business people, government officials. And I think that is a clear indication and nobody complains. Uh, on certain countries, uh, there is public complaint that we have kept the, uh, the, the, the ports open um, and that we should close it down for people coming from certain countries. There's no comment about us having kept that door open for people to people exchanges with the United States. So that is a clear indication of, of the, the importance of this tie to the everyday people in, in our country. I, th I will not pass judgment on how, how um, other governments have dealt with this and uh, the, 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 uh, the, um, the evaluation from their own public, but certainly the United States is a much bigger country than us. It's a federal system. We are a country that has a very highly wired uh, public health infrastructure to begin with, and that's been very helpful. Uh, but I always say even with all that wiring, if we didn't really uh, systematically, uh, patiently, methodically try to build this trust with full transparency, uh, uh, we would, uh, none of these tools would matter all that much because I also know of countries where we, they have very few of these digital tools, but just by the patient effort on the authorities to build that trust um, right. and asking people to wear masks and do social distancing and the public adhering to the public guidance, they have very much been able to curb the spread of the virus. The trust I, is the key ingredient as it is in any disaster response. But the core point of your question about this, I think COVID-19 has, has added to that, that specialness between uh, the United States and the Republic of Korea. Well, well, I'm glad to hear that um, because there was a Pew poll last month uh, that found that South Korea's uh, South Koreans holding favorable views of the United States has actually dropped over the last four years from 84 percent to 59 percent today, and that the percentage of South Korean uh, citizens who say they have confidence in the U.S. president has gone from 88% uh, to a pretty worrisome 17% uh, today. I don't want to uh, 
politicize the conversation, but, you know, as foreign minister, and you've been foreign minister for much of this time, um, beyond COVID, uh, how does the change in public attitudes uh, in your society uh, affect our bilateral ties? I think um, it, it, there are, it, we are an alliance that has a strong history of having solved difficult issues together. Uh, one pending issue is the special measures agreement, uh, whereby Korea pays for some of the cost of the U.S. troops stationed here in the, on the Korean Peninsula. We've had this arrangement since 1991, and over a period of several rounds, our share of that cost has increased as it should because our economy and our wealth has continued to grow. Uh, it was something like 150 million uh, at the beginning of the 1990s. Um, last year, it was nearly a billion dollars. So yes, our contribution have, have, uh, have increased over the years. The current round, which is still pending after intense and negotiations hasn't been resolved yet, hasn't reached agreement yet. And I think uh, the, uh, the public frustration with uh, the lack of agreement, uh, the positions remain still very much apart. And the, you know, as government, we don't ascertain or give out any concrete numbers, but with many reports um, coming out on some of those concrete numbers indicating uh, a request for a huge increase from the United States. I, I, I think this is a big part of the dissatisfaction on, on, the, on the part of the public uh, because it, 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 it's important that we have this agreement. We have found the solution in the interim so that uh, part of the arrangement uh, continues even without the agreement. Uh, uh, and that's the Korean workers who work for the U.S. troops here. Uh, they're, they're continuing to work because we found an agreement to continue this. And I think that, you know, anything with the United States is an important issue here. It's, uh, it's vigorously discussed. Uh, there are views. Views are expressed. And the SMA, of course, is a very important issue. So I think that has fed uh, the frustration and negative uh, uh, sentiment on the part of our public and we listen very carefully and, and pay much attention because in the end this is something that we need to pass through the National Assembly and uh, where of course uh, public sentiment matters a great deal. Well I think that your point about the importance of uh, public support for not only the Alliance but stationing of US forces on Korean soil is is so important and in my career as a diplomat serving in South Korea, but also handling uh, U.S. policy for Asia, I learned uh, without any doubt that uh, we, we are guests in your country uh, and that we have to uh, be attentive to uh, the, the needs and the views and the wishes of, of the people there. You may be understating a little bit uh, South Korea's prowess in negotiations. I think uh, from what I've heard, the, the President Trump started uh, with a demand for a 500% increase in uh, the special measures agreement. And, and I think you've whittled him down to at least uh, a 50% increase. But as you point out, uh, there's still a long way to go. Uh, I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you uh, if you're waiting to see if Trump gets reelected or, or how this is going to play out. Because the bigger issue, frankly, is not uh, the money. Uh, it's the ability of the U.S. forces in Korea in partnership with uh, South Korea's military, uh, to effectively deter aggression, uh, to defend the ROK and to maintain uh, stability not only on the peninsula but in the region as well and it's no secret that uh, our president has complained that allies have well let's say taken the united states for a ride that americans have been suckers for defending other democracies and that makes allies freeloaders and so on and you don't have to read that in john bolton's book or bob woodward's book because uh, what the president has talked about more than once publicly is the idea of withdrawing 
U.S. troops from uh, South Korea. He's already announced a drawdown uh, in Germany. Uh, Secretary Esper uh, didn't deny press reports that the Pentagon had been tasked to provide options uh, for a, a partial withdrawal of troops. And I know that uh, people like me who uh, pay attention to security issues in the region are very concerned. And I wonder what would the reaction be in South Korea if President Trump, in fact, uh, signaled that he was going to follow through on, on, on that threat? Well, you know, eh, diplomats don't respond to ifs or hypotheticals, but I can tell you that this is not a matter of discussion between our two militaries. And uh, we expect every issue uh, to be the re and the conclusion to be the result of close consultations between our two mil uh, militaries and, and governments. But I am, of, of course, absolutely confident about the, the, the mutual interest um, of this alliance and the troop stationing here uh, in terms of the U.S. strategic security interest, but also, of course, uh, South Korea's uh, security interest. And, uh, you know, we make sure that the combined defense posture of that alliance uh, here materially, uh, visibly is maintained at the solid level. Well, um, I'm certainly with you on that, as I think uh, most of the national security establishment in the United States is, so thank you. Um, what we are trying to uh, defend against and what we are seeking to deter is the threat posed by North Korea and its uh, aggressive uh, accumulation of nuclear weapons, of ballistic missiles, and so on. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about North Korea and hear what you think. I know that uh, we heard President Moon, again, in his UNGA address this year, talk about how the international community can help to end the Korean War, as you yourself described, almost at the same time, North Korea shot and killed a South Korean citizen at sea, and then burned his body. Um, there's been a, uh, an effort to pursue a peace process under the uh, Moon administration. Uh, we're two years out from the Pyongyang Joint Declaration. Could you um, give us your assessment of the situation on the Korean Peninsula? Uh, you mentioned a bit of a stalemate in some areas, but what's what's the scorecard, would you say? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, post Hanoi, um, where the U.S. and the North Korean leader could not reach an agreement on the on the denuclearization track, um, there have been efforts to revive that. Unfortunately, it hasn't uh, made progress. We have tried to pick up the South North Korea track. Um, and these two go in parallel, uh, complements each other, but both tracks have been stalled um, and it's frustrating. Uh, but both the United States and uh, we have made, you know, we, have, we, we, we remain ready to re-engage in dialogue. Of course, we watch very carefully um, uh, through whatever information and intelligence means that we have the developments in North Korea, particularly their, their nuclear missiles uh, program. But uh, we, our offer of dialogue remains. Um, I think the current, this year has been particularly difficult for North Korea. It says it doesn't have any COVID-19 cases. Hard to believe. I think we have to proceed assuming that there would be cases in North Korea. But the pandemic has meant North Korea completely closing down. Uh, whatever limited interaction that it has had with the outside world, including including the the trading on the northern border with uh, with China. So it this is an indication that they're having a hard time with this. Um, 
added to that, the summer months have been brutal with floods and heavy showers. So the message that's coming out from the North Korea seems to be that they're very much focused on internal matters, uh, addressing these issues and uh, assuring the public uh, that the leadership is actively dealing with these issues. Uh, a key point to watch is uh, will be uh, what they want to send uh, at, at, to the outside world in terms of the messages on October 10th, which is the anniversary of their, their common party founding. Uh, but they, they are, have also publicly um, committed to announcing a new plan uh, for economic revival at the, at the early days of next year. So they, there are public engagements, public days that we need to see uh, where the thinking is going, but we certainly hope, and we are very much doing our messaging uh, so that uh, it encourages, urges North Korea to come back to the dialogue table towards denuclearization and inter-Korean cooperation. Thank you, Minister. Um, and I fully understand that uh, both the Republic of Korea and the United States uh, remain ready, uh, that we're watching closely, that uh, we're ready for dialogue and so on. I I've accept also that North Korea has had a rough year facing floods, facing COVID-19. But the question is whether rather than making progress, not just in this year, but over the last uh, two plus years or longer, uh, we've lost ground. I mean, North Korea blew up the inner Korean liaison building. Uh, Kim Jong-un didn't visit Seoul as hoped. In fact, his own sister uses pretty disrespectful language, even when uh, talking about your president. Uh, the COVID-19 aid that South Korea has offered was largely ignored. North Korea refuses to hold dialogue or family reunions. Uh, no progress really now in economic engagement. The military hotline is cut off. The U.S. and the ROK canceled our joint exercises or scaled them down, but the North Koreans continued with theirs. And it's true they've held off so far on new ICBM tests or new nuclear tests uh, in the last two years, but they've gone ahead with submarine launch missiles and medium range missiles and uh, with a massive expansion of their nuclear arsenal. And now they're threatening a new strategic weapon, whatever that is. Uh, and they're doing a pretty good job of evading sanctions and of obtaining foreign currency through cyber theft and ransomware and so on. So I guess the question is, um, Aren't we moving backwards? And is the situation uh, likely to get better, even though we want to have dialogue? Well, I think, as I said, engaging with this very closed and insular uh, um, uh, country is very, very difficult and, and frustrating, but it takes a lot of patience. I think. You know, incidents have to be analyzed and studied for the implication for the longer term process. But the longer term process ha has to be peaceful engagement. Uh, we absolutely uh, reject any military solutions to this. Um, we are about uh, so consolidating peace and, uh, and if possible, co-prosperity with North Korea all within keeping uh, with adhering to the to the UN sanctions regime. We ask for waivers where necessary, and we have received uh, waivers uh, for quite a, a number of our inter-Korean projects uh, over the years, and we will continue to do so. But uh, we're clear that the sanctions regime has to be adhered to, and we make that point uh, with other countries as well. I think, is have, have we set back or have we moved forward? I think you know, that judgment has to be made in the longer term. I think every time an incident like uh, a few days ago happens, it 
certainly undermines our readiness and our goodwill, our patience. But I think in the end, uh, in the longer term, we need to stay the course of peaceful engagement. You mentioned, Minister, the upcoming uh, 75th anniversary of the Korean Workers' Party, the October 10th celebration. Um, and I know that North Korea has, uh, in the past, at times used the big parade it holds on that holiday to roll out uh, new weapons and so on. I wonder if, is that one of the signals that uh, you're, you had in mind? And, and do you have a prediction for what the signal will tell us on October the 10th? Well, we'll, we'll see uh, when, when October 10th rolls around. Um, but beyond the usual activities, uh, my um, military folks uh, are really keeping close taps on all the developments in close information sharing with their U.S. counterparts. Um, but we will see uh, when that day rolls around. But we certainly hope and urge North Korea for that signal to be a one that is um, leading to constructive re-engagement uh, rather than the other way. Well, there too, I'm, I'm with you 100%. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, regional diplomacy. Um, and uh, I'll get to one of the questions from our audience, which, uh, because South Korea has uh, such complicated relations with its two biggest neighbors, uh, Japan and, and China. Uh, perhaps we could start with Japan, which has a, a brand new prime minister. I read that uh, President Moon called uh, the new Prime Minister Suga to congratulate him and uh, make clear that he wants to work together uh, to find a mutually acceptable solution to some of the outstanding problems uh, in the bilateral relationship. Uh, so the question is, is the South Korean government willing to put anything on the table in its talks with Japan to try to get uh, this renewed relationship off on a positive note, to try to reverse uh, the downward spiral. The conversation between the new prime minister and my president yesterday, I think was a very positive one. And a change in leadership is always a good time uh, to generate some positive dynamics. Uh, the issue of the past is the difficult, uh, uh, if the difficult um, uh, challenge, uh, and most more concretely, the our Supreme Court ruling on the issue of forced labor. And you know, as a democratic government, no government will go against the judgment of our highest legal authority, the Supreme Court. So there are certain, certain, certain musts that we must uh, adhere to. That is making sure that that, that judgment is, is respected and implemented and the plaintiffs uh, are awarded the, the, the re reparations and compensations that they were ordered by the court. Within that parameter, we have been very creative in trying to find a way to, uh, suf suf uh, to meet those conditions while also uh, me addressing the Japanese position, which is that they, they don't accept this, that all claims have been settled by the 1965 um, claims agreement, uh, which we disagree with, uh, but uh, given, given the different d interpretations of the 65 agreement, we have tried to find, uh, uh, find the margins where we can meet uh, so that we meet our conditions and the Japanese are able to say, uh, stay with their position. Uh, it's not that we've not been talking. We've been talking at various levels, officially, unofficially, uh, uh, and we will continue to do so. And I think uh, that conversation yesterday, uh, renewing uh, that will on both sides to find a way forward has been a, has been a good uh, start for my president and the prime minister. And as the foreign ministry, we will certainly work very closely with our counterparts to make sure that this renewed goodwill uh, leads to some advances. 
That's very encouraging, Minister. Thank you. So I'm, I'm taking away the sense that you feel that uh, there is a renewed goodwill that could harness some of the creativity of Korean diplomacy to find a way to square the circle of the Korean Supreme Court ruling on forced labor compensation with the, the terms of the uh, 1965 bilateral treaty. That, that would be wonderful. But there's another issue uh, dogging the relationship from the past uh, that had at one point uh, been addressed by the agreement on the so-called comfort women, uh, comfort women agreement. Um, is that something also that with a little creativity can be in some fashion uh, revived? Having thoroughly reviewed how that agreement came about, uh, because the response of the public, no matter which side of the, the political spectrum, has been very critical inside the country. And so coming in, we took a very thorough review of how that agreement came about and concluded that this doesn't solve the issue, uh, but that we will not ask to renegotiate or to break it uh, because it's not an issue to be resolved through diplomatic negotiations. Uh, I've talked to many of the victims and you know, these are very elderly ladies in their 80s, 90s, and, and we, we continue to lose them one or two every year. They, they're their number one ask is a sincere apology that is sincere when it's given and sincere, uh, sustained sin sincerity. And I don't think the 2015 agreement offered them that. And uh, so we, we are not going to negotiate with Japan uh, on this issue. But we, as government, uh, with the responsibility to protect uh, these um, victims, uh, although the, the, the pain was not caused by our government, uh, we are doing what we can. We support them uh, materially, uh, mentally, physically, but we are also making sure that this issue of sexual violence in armed conflict and, and the comfort in women was one of uh, the most egregious cases. We, we make sure that this stays on our, our, our uh, foreign policy agenda and that we play an active role in the women, peace and security uh, agenda uh, at and around the United Nations. Well, I'm not hearing quite the same level of uh, encouragement uh, about the potential for creative diplomacy uh, to address that other major uh, outstanding point of contention between Tokyo and Seoul, but I am heartened uh, President Moon said that South Korea and Japan are the closest of friends who share basic values and strategic interests, as well as uh, partners that should cooperate for uh, peace and prosperity in the Northeast, in Northeast Asia. And I wondered if that suggests that South Korea might, in fact, be willing to join the so-called Quad Plus, the, the four um, major democracies uh, besides South Korea in the region, U.S., India, Japan, Australia, make up the Quad. Korea has not been part of that, but now the idea has been put forward that there could be a, a grouping of the Quad Plus is that uh, something that uh, the Korean government is open to? Well, we don't think um, anything that automatically shuts out and uh, as exclusive of the interest of others is a good idea. We've not been uh, uh, invited uh, by the Quad to be a part of this. We are willing to engage in discussions on specific issues, but if that's a structure uh, and a, a, a structured alliance, we would certainly think 
very hard uh, about uh, whether it serves our security interest. Um, uh, but on specific issues, we're, I think, very ready to have a discussion uh, with whoever has, a, has a, a, an approach that is inclusive, open, and in accordance with international norms. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the party that's excluded, <laughs> obviously, uh, is China. And that brings us to uh, the uh, bilateral relationship uh, between Seoul and Beijing. And here again, I'm going to uh, reach back into my personal history and say that I'm, I'm very proud that when I served uh, at the UN in the 90s in that same period, I mentioned I had a, a small hand also in helping to jumpstart the normalization process between Seoul and Beijing. But, but now the, the minister of the US-China relationship has deteriorated so dramatically that it puts uh, many countries in the region, uh, I think in, uh, including uh, the Republic of Korea, in a sometimes difficult uh, position uh, where Beijing is pulling in one direction and, and Washington is pulling in the other. Uh, you know, I know from my own experience that countries in the region want to have it both ways. They want to get all the benefits of a good relationship with China, all the benefits of good relationship with the United States, and they certainly don't want to get caught in the crossfire. But um, I'm curious, as someone who, as foreign minister, is walking this tightrope, uh, in the current environment, is that still realistic? Uh, can Korea have it both ways? Well, well, I don't think realistic or not is uh, is the answer. I think it's tr you know finding your own way. I think uh, this idea of choice is not helpful. I think uh, we are very clear that our the anchor is our the U.S. ROK alliance. Uh, but as you say, our par strategic partnership. With, the, with China, who is our biggest trading partner and economic partner, is also very important for our, 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 our businessmen and people. So it's, we, we juggle these issues um, and we deal with issue as they arise. Um, but, you know, I think this is you know, a challenge for all countries uh, with the two big biggest powers um, in, a, in a rivalry that continues to deepen and expand. Um, I think, you know, you just have to have to um, see what your leverage is. And it's Korea's certainly in a just political position uh, that looks like if we are caught in the crossfire. But I think you can turn that around and say this is, in fact, a uh, leverage. And as a as a middle power that is increasingly competent, uh, it's we have partners elsewhere, and I think uh, utilizing those partnerships with like-minded friends, uh, like-minded countries, uh, we will we will f make sure that our interest, our security interests, and our economic interests are preserved and promoted. Well, thank. Speaking of. Uh middle powers and speaking of like-minded friends, uh, one of the questions we've got from our audience is about uh, South Korea's uh, relationship with Taiwan, another uh, very effective uh, case study in dealing with COVID-19. Uh, recently, a senior U.S. government uh, official uh, visited and attended the funeral for former uh, President Lee Dong Wei, um, the former Prime Minister of Japan, uh, Mr. Mori, uh, similarly visited. Uh, the question is uh, whether, Minister, you could tell us a little bit about uh, the ROK's relationship with uh, Taiwan uh, and uh, whether you think ties with Taiwan uh, will expand and improve in light of your many uh, common uh, interests as fellow democracies? I think Taiwan um, 
has a is you know we very much adhere to the principle of one country two systems uh, our economic ties our people to people ties with taiwan is very rich and we very much hope to keep it that way uh, but the 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 international relations framework that have evolved over the past decades, uh, I think needs to be preserved uh, for the stability of this region, and we will certainly do so. Well, we all have an interest in uh, democracy and we have an interest in stability, for sure. Um, the other uh, party uh, with whom both China and the Republic of Korea have extraordinarily important relationships uh, is of course, North Korea. And Beijing uh, for a number of years, uh, once Kim Jong-un uh, came to power, uh, had, has been pretty tough, particularly after the execution of uh, Chang Song Tech. Beijing has been tough on North Korea uh, began in 2017 to really implement uh, sanctions with a enthusiasm and a resolve that uh, none of us had ever seen before. Uh, that stopped and China reversed course uh, in 2018 once President Trump announced that he planned to meet directly with Kim Jong un. And of course, uh, uh, Xi Jinping beat him to the punch uh, by inviting uh, Kim twice to Beijing. And there's kind of been no looking back since then. China's dramatically increased its support for the North Korea. For North Korea, it's relaxed its enforcement of sanctions. It's resumed some assistance, some trade, given a lot more political support and cover to North Korea. Um, how problematic is it from uh, South Korea's point of view for China to have regained so much uh, influence and, and reverted to the old model of backing Pyongyang? I think it's a, I think it's a lot more nuanced than that. I think uh, the simple uh, conclusion that uh, a reversal, of course, uh, dramatically includes uh, support uh, have to be, uh, I think, need to be uh, taken into the larger context. China has been fully supportive of South-North engagement. It has uh, said that, and it continues to say, it is abiding by the sanctions. It has called for an easing of the sanctions because it's appraisal of how far North Korea has come in terms of the denuclearization tract is, I would say, more generous uh, than the rest of the, 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 rest of the world. Uh, but they have, and they don't publish our, uh, what is given in terms of humanitarian assistance to North Korea. So we don't exactly know the scale, but we do know that trade relations have really frozen up. Um, so how much uh, is given is 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 needs more evidence um, to be um, to be certain about those things. But I think China has continued to say that U.S. North Korea dialogue is important. U.S. South Korea, North Korea dialogue is important and, and they continue to support this. We very much hope, uh, and I, I, I think it makes sense. Uh, it's reasonable for China uh, to stay that course because North Korea's denuclearization, uh, tactically you may differ, but I think that strategic goal is uh, very much in the interest of both the United States, China, and South Korea, and the region, in the world, in fact. Absolutely. Well, Minister, um, China may be generous with its uh, interpretation of North Korea's progress towards denuclearization, and it may be generous with its assistance to the DPRK, but you've been generous uh, with your time and sharing your uh, wisdom with us. Uh, the hour has really flown by, at least for us, may feel, may have dragged out uh, for you because uh, I asked you some tough questions, but of course uh, you were eminently capable of, of answering them. And you've given us a lot of insight into South Korea's approach to 
uh, many of the tough uh, and many of the important challenges uh, that, that face us all and that you're working on. Um, South Korea's soft power has um, won so many friends and admirers in the United States uh, on top of uh, the large uh, support that historically uh, the ROK has enjoyed. Um, but with the advent of uh, popularized Korean food, we were talking earlier about K-pop and BTS. For me, and for many people, I think it's watching Korean baseball with actual mm -hmm. human beings in the stands that practically brings tears to the eyes of uh, many Americans. And for me, having served at the United Nations like you, um, and having served at the U.S. Embassy in, in Seoul, South Korea, uh, I, for one, have a very deep uh, admiration and respect for Korea's many uh, terrific diplomats, uh, and certainly for all that you do. So let me uh, end, since it's nine o'clock here, by thanking you for uh, sharing your, your thoughts and your wisdom with us. Uh, thank you also for your service uh, and kamsamida. Thank you so much. It's been great to engage with you. And I certainly hope that we will be meeting in person very soon. Thank you. I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank Ms. you very much.